Eastern Front was the conflict at the heart of the First World War. A struggle which devastated the lives of Eastern Europe's peoples as old scores were settled, new hatreds forged. A harbinger of the Second World War. There has never been such a war as this, waged with such bestial fury. This was a racial war between Teuton and Slav, between the Germans and Austro-Hungarians on one side and Russia and her Slav ally Serbia on the other. Caught between the clashing giants were Poles, Ukrainians, Lithuanians, Croatians, Jews, without statehood or voice, with no means of defense. It was also a war of alliances stretched to breaking point. Germany, hands full on the Western Front, looked to Austria-Hungary to bear the brunt of a Russian attack. But Austria-Hungary's empire was crumbling and weak. Theirs was a partnership with different agendas, many enemies. Germany's eastern flank bordered directly onto Russia, down what is now Poland. To Austria-Hungary's south lay her dreaded enemy, Serbia. Around them, a ring of neutrals, as yet undecided which side to join. Russian troops are blessed before leaving for the war. One officer presented his men with an historic opportunity. Hey, brothers. Our eternal enemy, Germany, is trying to enslave Russia, our country, which has long suffocated under Germany's dead weight. The time has come to end their Teutonic rule. Not everyone saw the conflict in such epic terms. Russian conscript Vasily Mishnin left to fight the Germans, filled with dread. A shiver ran through my whole body. The third whistle. Everybody breaks down. I kiss my Nura for the last time. And all my family kiss me. Nura shouts, why are you crying, Vasusha? You said you weren't going to cry. The challenge to this war on the backward side of Europe was logistics. There were vast distances to cover, from the Urals to the Alps, with desperate problems of communications and supply. On the 17th of August, 1914, the Russian First Army seized the initiative and invaded Germany. This would be a mobile war, and some units went in hard from the start. Russian cavalry officer Vladimir Litauer had already crossed the border, scouting ahead. We started while it was still dark. Around seven o'clock in the morning, our squadron reached the objective for the day, a large German farm. The scene on the German side of the border was frightening. For miles, farms, haystacks and barns were burning. Like every army under the sun, we looted and destroyed. 
and later hated to admit it. The scope for atrocity was greatest where places suddenly changed hands, where soldiers lived off the land, where you weren't sure who the enemy was. Litau's regiment was fired on at the village of Santopen in East Prussia. The Russians blamed locals for directing the attack from the church town. Grotten completely lost his temper and shouted, they are all spies, shoot them. In a moment, they were all dead. Horror stories spread as 12-year-old German Peter Kur recorded in her diary. Whole columns of East Prussian refugees came through our town. Many are crying. There are mothers with tiny children. They say Russians tied German women who stay behind to trees, set up wooden crosses in front of them, and nail their little children to them. When the kiddies have died before their mother's eyes, the Russians mutilate the women and kill them. The German army fell back a hundred miles. Two men took over Germany's defense in the east. General Paul von Hindenburg, brought out of retirement, and General Erich Ludendorff, poached from the offensive in the west. They would in time become more powerful than the Kaiser. The Germans planned to hit the Russian Second Army in these woods, near the East Prussian town of Tannenberg, where, 500 years before, a Polish army had defeated a force of Teutons. The stakes were high, Germany fighting to defend her native soil. Julius Bolt's regiment was whisked from western to eastern front. After a 60-hour train ride, a quick march for nearly four hours straight to the battlefield, I had my baptism of fire. Oddly enough, it left me completely cold. In a flash, I thought of home, gave one glance to heaven, and then straight into the line of fire. When the injured scream, your heart clams up. There's almost nothing left of this hospitable town. What's left of the buildings is either still burning or in ruins. Charred corpses lie in the streets. Tannenberg stopped the Russians in their tracks and made up for the lack of German victory in the West. Hindenburg and Ludendorff were seen as saviors of the nation, as schoolgirl Pieter wrote. Paul von Hindenburg is mighty big and strong. He has a square head with a moustache and many wrinkles in his face. The people here in the East worship him. Germany needed heroes. The battle entered pan-German mythology. Payback for the Russian invasion final revenge for that ancient defeat. This massive monument was completed in 1927, a rallying symbol for Germany's ambitious right. A few years later, Hindenburg showed Adolf Hitler the site of Germany's historic triumph. Today, the monument lies in ruins, blown up by the Russians after the Second World War, last blow in the saga of Slav Teuton clashes at Tannenberg. Poland, January 1915. The Russians were firmly dug in. The Germans were now on the offensive, 
trying to dislodge them. The village of Bolimov was in the front line. The Germans turned to technology to give them the edge over the Russians. Bolimov would be the testbed for an experimental weapon. Francis Smolinski, a civilian, raised the alarm. I got up, went outside, and then I saw this something which looked like smoke. I ran back home, shouting, fire, fire. Behind the Russian lines, General Basil Gurko got snippets of information that didn't add up. Hundreds mysteriously killed, trenches full of corpses that might not be dead. Bodies in a state of collapse with little sign of life were lying in the wood. What was the reason for this unusual occurrence? Had some of those already buried been in a state of coma and not dead at all? From this church tower, German observers watched the first major use of chemical warfare ever. The Germans fired 18,000 tear gas shells onto the Russians. The conventional wisdom is that the wind was blowing the wrong way and it was too cold for the gas to work. The Russians withstood the attack. But there were victims, as General Gurko heard and Francis Smolinski saw. They were carried, crowded onto wagons, some lying on top of others. Those who could walked. Their faces were pale blue, 